Good morning. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's 1 Peter 1 3. Why don't you stand with us? Sing together. Well, I know He rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe. My shame is taken away. My pain is healed in His name. I believe. I believe. I'll raise a banner As my Lord has conquered the grave My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives And again, I know I know He rescued my soul And His Good morning again. Please be seated. We've got some announcements for you, and we'll get back to it. I am Robert Ames. I'm one of the elders here, and I have your announcements this morning. And as I made my list of announcements, and I I tucked it in my Bible, I tucked it in in the book of Nehemiah. Not not intending to do that, but I I thought, well, I've got to say something about that. Because as you know, this half of the building over here behind me was destroyed by a flood in February. And so we are so thankful to be in here where we are this morning and just to have, see this room made new, so to speak. And knowing that we're working over there and God is providing. So I'd just like to say how thankful we are to everybody who has put work into what you see here. All the people that help get the the rebuilding process moving Uh, all the people that put in physical labor to get this going, the AV team who set up a temporary AV um, booth, and then Phil gave up his office for all the extra AV equipment, and then for them to have us ready in here this morning with the lights and the the monitors, and just all the work that has gone into rebuilding. And in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah talks about the people had a mind to work and to serve God, and to rebuild. So I would just like to ask for a, in a second here, a round of applause just to, just to show our thankfulness to God and our thankfulness to all of our volunteers who have done what you, and contributed to what you see here today and, what, and the work that is still being done. So a special thanks to our AV team, special thanks to Dennis Kirshner, our building supervisor who's worked tirelessly uh, special thanks to our building committee and to all the people that have helped out so much and to all the generosity and the giving that's been going on as well. So if we could just have a round of applause. All right. 
Thank God for what he's doing here. So, announcements. I'm going to go in date order. We have a lot of things going on in April, so get your calendars ready. So if you're new to NBBC or you want to learn more about it, we have a welcome class for newcomers starting next Sunday, the 11th. That's going to be at 9 a.m. here in our, our library over here. And you can learn about our history, our beliefs, our doctrine, uh, the different ministry opportunities, and you can meet other people that are new to the church. So you can sign up on the Church Center app on your phone, or you can let the church office know. Then we're going to give you a, a weekend off, and then we're going to have a Romans Bible study workshop, and that's going to be on April 23rd. That's a Friday night, and it'll be Friday night and Saturday. We're going to go through the, the first five chapters of the book of Romans, verse by verse, and we're going to go through with PowerPoints and student workbooks. And anyone who attends the class will be given all the teaching materials after the class so you can reteach it. And so I especially want to invite high school kids and anyone that's interested in a verse-by-verse -verse teaching through the book of Romans that's going to give you a tool that you will not only learn it, but you will be able to reteach it down the road. So we need you to sign up for that because we're making student manuals and we're also going to feed you lunch. So again, that's Friday and Saturday night, April 23rd and 24th. And then the weekend after that, we're going to have an evangelism opportunity at the car show at the county fairgrounds. That's going to be Friday and Saturday. We're going to set up our evangelism booth. And if you're interested in coming out and participating or just watching, you can contact the church office uh, or let me know. And then we're out of April. Now we're going to get into May. May 9th, we're going to have a baby dedication uh, service. And we would love to pray with you uh, corporately if you have a, a, a baby or a young child that you would just like prayer for to dedicate them being raised according to God's word and something we would just like to share that with you. Okay, and speaking of Nehemiah and rebuilding, I have an update for you on our building project. Okay, we do have insurance. But insurance, when they come in and evaluate how much they're going to cover they look at a depreciation basis. And so they look at, well, how old was the carpet or how old was the paint? How old were different things in the facility? And they determine how to reimburse based on a depreciation factor. That's, that's customary, we've talked to people, that's standard practice. And so because uh, the carpet and things were older, the insurance is going to not pay you know, the, the full cost of repair. And so we would just like the body to know about this, so just to open it up for any giving. Uh, everyone has been generous, uh, but now is the time. With, with as, as people give, as you give, we can then, we're able to know what we can do to, to repair things, and we can, you know, take advantage of the opportunities that we have here to upgrade things. So we just like to let you know that... Um, Right now, giving is just very important towards, the, towards the, uh, the building project. And so as the Lord leads you, we'd just like you to, to consider that. I'd like to close in prayer. Uh, dear, dear Father, we just thank you for what you've done here, for all the hard work and the labor that's gone into it. Father, we just desire to be your servants. We desire to lift up Jesus Christ. And we thank you for what you're doing here, Father, the opportunities we have in the, in the months ahead. And thank you for all your provisions, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand with us. Sing together. Sing to the King. Sing to the King who is coming to reign.
together again for his returning. If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. That's uh, Romans 6, 8. Let's sing this together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the depth of Christ. I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. There in the ground. His 
body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth. For 
forsaken, the glorious King is taken, all our sins upon His head. The death in the grave are broken, the light of the world is spoken, we are free, we've been redeemed, the hero. Father, we thank you for the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the new birth into a living hope that you have given us. We thank you that we have this hope as an anchor for our souls. And we thank you that because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we are raised together with Christ, seated with you in the heavenly places. We thank you that, as we sang, you're going to return and restore all things Strengthen our hope this day as we celebrate the day you rose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. And children are dismissed at this time. Morning. There we go. I want to add my word of thanks to God for all of those who have given sacrificially, those who have uh, given sacrificially of time, talent, treasure. In the last less than two months, what has happened here, uh, both in destruction and in construction, has been nothing short of almost miraculous. Now, I had some pictures and I thought, you know, maybe I could show you some pictures for those of you who weren't aware of what it was like. But when I drove up here on February 15th, uh, about seven o'clock in the evening, and I pulled into uh, the electricity, uh, I'm going to be coming and going here, guys, I think. I'll just, uh, is this something with me? This is time out, guys, but this is what happens when you start streaming your services. Everything goes wrong. Uh, okay, it's working, and then sometimes it's not. So I'm off. <laughs> oh, testing one, two, three. I'm on. Boy, I. I This is a trick. Uh, while down near the front, yeah. and it was uh, amazing to watch. Uh, 
Are you enjoying? You got it. You uh, are you guys? Hey boy, I'm going to talk very softly this morning. Uh, is this? Okay, I'm putting that in my pocket. There I go. Good. All right. Testing, testing, okay. Well, take your Bibles, please. Along this morning, this is still going to be interesting. I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians 15. After that, I'm going to be in Romans chapter 8. And after that, I will read a verse or two from Hebrews chapter 2. You can follow along if you'd like to. But I want to start by saying, He is risen. He is risen I think I'm going to make this more of a habit because it's a nice thing to remind ourselves that He is risen. Just a moment. By the end of this message, everything is going to be working well. Uh, that... What God has done here is a reflection, I think, in a way of the resurrection, uh, because this room was not usable at all. Uh, it was under water, late, and uh, so I just uh, am thankful that all that has been done here, there have been people working here almost daily. Uh, sometimes they are contractors. They are people from the congregation. And uh, I'm just thrilled about what we have here. This morning, um, hello, let's get rid of this thing. Hello. <laughs> Is this one working? Yeah, that one's working. Okay, guys, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to stick with this one. Wait a minute. Yes, maybe so. Maybe we're going to. All right, we're going to. Help this work. Does it work when I look down or? Keep talking. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and read some scripture. And what I'd like to do this morning, I, I need to warn you ahead of time, those of you who know that I normally read from the New American Standard Version, I am not going to be reading from the New American Standard Version this morning. I'm going to be reading three passages, uh, three collections of passages, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 8, Hebrews 2, all from what is called the New Living Translation. This is a modern uh, uh, translation based on a paraphrase, but it is based also in Greek. So um, that's what we're going to do this morning. So I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 and 13. This is what I read. Tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead... Why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised 
to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. Now shifting to Romans chapter 8, but the same author we read. All creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We, too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. And then I finish with two verses from Hebrews chapter 2. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Now, I started reading this morning from 1 Corinthians 15, and many of you know that 1 Corinthians 15, uh, more than any other chapter in the entire Bible, focuses on resurrection. In fact, it's called by many people the resurrection chapter. And in this chapter, Paul responds to some people in Corinth who denied that there was any resurrection. That is, they were denying that there was any future resurrection for them. But there was one thing that was very clear in the discussion that Paul had in 1 Corinthians 15. And that is this. Whether or not a person believed in the resurrection... There was one thing all of them agreed on. There is death. None of them were denying that there was death. The question was, is there resurrection or is there not? And it is in fact because of the unavoidableness of death that the whole question of resurrection really matters. Now, most people today would say they don't like to think or talk about death. And frankly, I don't either, at least not my own. A while back, I received in the mail, and some of you have received these. I don't know if they start doing this when you reach a certain age, which I won't say what mine is. But, uh, you know, you start getting these deals in the mail, and they're a deal. It says... Pay for your own funeral ahead of time. And they even make it, they make it sound good. They don't say anything about funeral or death. This one said, affordable final expense solutions. There's nothing in there that sounds bad, except that I knew what they were talking about. Pal, you're about to croak. Pay for it. So I threw it in the trash. 
You know, the truth be told, death is always somewhere in the back of our minds. Hollywood knows this, and they have made hay with it. Hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of movies have been made addressing dying and life after death. And you are guilty as charged. You flock to them. I do too. Listen, here are some titles. Don't raise your hands. You'll get tired. But how many of these movies have you seen? And this is just a, I'm just scraping the surface. Uh, here we go. Corpse Bride. Soul. That was really good, wasn't it? Okay. Um, Death Becomes Her. Poltergeist. Uh, heaven is for real. How about heaven can wait? It's a wonderful life. Ooh, there's a good one. Field of Dreams, best baseball movie ever. Ghost, Ghost Story, All of Me, The Sixth Sense, Ooh. Beetlejuice, Down to Earth, Defending Your Life, What Dreams May Come, Flatliners, Monty Python is the meaning of life. Okay, I'm going to stop there. On and on it goes. Why do we so like movies about death, life after death, coming back from the dead? Well, I think there's a reason here. I think it is because they get us to laugh or cry or, or just feel good about death. They sort of calm our fears. After all, if Hollywood can depict something, then probably reality can't be much worse than that. And you know, a lot of famous people talk about death as well. And I have noticed that almost all of them, when they talk about death, they assure us that there is nothing to fear. Not that long ago, the Jeopardy! game show host Alex Trebek was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. And after that, as he fought the disease, he talked openly about his impending death. He said, I'm not afraid of dying. When death happens, it happens. Why should I be afraid of it? Now, if it involves physical suffering, I might be afraid of that. But that's what hospice is for. They make it as easy as it can possibly be for you to transition into whatever future you happen to believe in. Unquote. Did you hear that? I, I'm not sure if you, you're snoozing through the Alex Trebek quote, so I need to give it to you again. The last line, whatever future you happen to believe in. But isn't that just the question? What will our experience be after we die? Alex Trebek did not know. Is it going to be whatever we happen to believe in? Or is it something else? Kurt Cobain, leader of the rock band Nirvana, before he committed suicide at age 27, wrote these words, If you die... You're completely happy, and your soul somewhere lives on. I am not afraid of dying. Total peace after death. Becoming someone else is the best hope I've got. Rap artist Sage Francis says, I'm not afraid of dying. Pieces of me die all the time. He's probably right. Uh, actress Catherine Hepburn, she had insight. She said, life is hard. After all, it kills you. She's great. Author J.K. Rowling. You know her. She said, To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. How does she know? Woody Allen, my favorite, he famously joked, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> you know, all of these movies and famous quotes about death and dying and life after death, 
all of them have one thing in common. Every person who made those movies, every person who acted in those movies, and every person who made those quotes knew nothing about what they were talking about. None of them had been there. None of them could tell you anything intelligent. All they could do was say something or depict something. They had no knowledge. Death is a mystery. I was watching a, a nature show recently that had a deep sea submersible uh, that could only fit three people crammed in. Uh, uh, do any of you get claustrophobic just thinking about things? I got claustrophobic because they went down five miles under the ocean to some of the deepest places in the ocean. And you know, it's going to take them a while to get back, and there are three of them crammed in there. If one of them starts, okay, let's not think about that because <laughs> you'll be thinking about it. But the narrator, what I thought was interesting is the narrator was talking about this as they're looking at this, this previously never seen, and he says, he said this, this is the last unknown frontier on earth. Uh, a lot of you, like me, marveled. Six weeks ago, NASA's Perseverance uh, rover landed on Mars. And I'm sure many of you have looked at some of these amazing pictures that have been sent back. Uh, it seems like we're always conquering new frontiers. But death is different. The more we talk about death, the less we realize we really know. If somebody should have known about death, it was Dr. Kevorkian. He was called, of all things, Dr. Death because he helped 130 people die. What he would do is he would tell terminal patients that euthanasia was their best option. He led them to death's door, but listen, he never went through it with them. He didn't know what was on the other side. Until uh, 10 years ago this July, when in 2011, he passed away. And now he knows, but he can't tell us. You see? Now, in recent years, medical technology has made it possible to revive people who were declared clinically dead. In fact, there are now thousands and thousands who have had what they call near-death experiences, and movies and books have been written about some of these experiences. Uh, some people tell of uh, after they die, they float up. And they can look down and they can see themselves. And, and then they, sometimes they float up and they can look at the, the world. They float over things. They see things from up high. Uh, some people tell of traveling through a dark tunnel. And there's a light at the other end. And it's approaching. And others tell of going to a heavenly kind of a perfect place, a utopia. They see angels. They see uh, dead relatives. And they have a deeper understanding of life. But the thing is, is none of these are the same. And so researchers have been trying to figure out, why is it do people get all these different experiences? And it's interesting, today surgeons uh, sometimes chill a patient's body and stop their heart in order to perform complex and difficult operations. And intentionally, they create a near-death condition. Severely injured trauma victims are often suspended between life and death until their wounds can be repaired. In one study that was performed uh, in a cardiac ward, researchers decided to test what people could see if they had a near-death experience. And so they put shelves up right next to the ceiling with objects that could only be seen if you were right up there or above the shelf. Nobody could see them from the floor. They then interviewed hundreds of cardiac arrest patients who died and were revived. And none of them reported seeing the objects. 
And so the questions nag, that is, uh, is our brain just producing something in those last moments that we want to believe happens after death? Are there some spiritual forces at play here? Despite all the research, death remains as much a mystery now as it ever has been. But listen, into this completely unknown realm, the words of Jesus are startling. In fact, it's like throwing a hand grenade in. It explodes with its meaning. He said these words at a funeral in Bethany, about two miles from where, just a few weeks later, he was going to be nailed to a cross and die. And these are his famous words. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. How could Jesus make that statement? On that day, at that funeral, Jesus knew something that nobody else there knew. Jesus was the only one at that funeral who knew what was in the future for him. He was the only one who knew of his upcoming death. And he was the only one who knew that he would rise from the dead. Now today, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For Christians, this has become the centerpiece of our faith, of our very existence. The world has a smorgasbord of religions uh, that are on offer for every one of us. Every religion has its founder or its guru or its prophet. And every one of those is in a grave somewhere buried, not Jesus. Yes, he died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And that's what makes his claim a few weeks before he died and rose again so compelling. If Jesus rose from the dead, if he was able to make that statement before it happened, what does his resurrection mean for me? What does it mean for anybody who would believe in Jesus as Savior? You know, you can ignore Jesus' words. Many people do. You can say you don't believe in resurrection. People did in the first century. People still do. But there's one thing you can't escape. You can't escape death. It comes for all of us. So what will you do? This is the question that nags at the back of the minds of all of us. Many people respond like some of those in Corinth did. Uh, I read it a few minutes ago. They, They said, there is no resurrection. You can't prove that. You live, you die, the end. And that's Greek culture. That kind of taught it to them. You know, if you can see it, if it's rational, if you can explain it, Okay, but if not, then don't try to make me believe it. Nobody can prove there's a resurrection, they reason. So, it doesn't exist. They remind us of scientists today who say there are no miracles. There's no supernatural. There is no spiritual realm. You remember what Paul replied to them? Paul was a lawyer. He also had economy of words. He said this, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus didn't rise either. After all, if there's no resurrection, there is no resurrection. But then he says this, but you know what? Jesus did rise from the dead. Now you might say, well, how could he say that? Because when he wrote this letter just 20 years earlier is when Jesus rose from the dead. And so there were people, lots of eyewitnesses, who told of this, who wrote about this. It's not like us. Yes, it is 2,000 years ago for us. But when he wrote it, people couldn't say that. 
if you said, but Jesus did rise from the dead, yeah, well, we know that, but yeah, well, if Jesus rose from the dead, then don't tell me there's no resurrection of the dead. It was impossible for them to dismiss it as a hoax. Even Roman historians refer to Jesus as the one who rose from the dead. It was something that was part of their lives. It would be like me saying, for example, let's say that, let's say that planes flew into the Twin Towers in 2001, and I was to deny that that ever really happened. You would say, uh, no, we know it happened because we saw it happen. And in the same way, when Paul says, but Jesus did rise from the dead, that kind of floored them. But now they have another question. There were some who scoffed at Paul and said, listen, you think you know everything about resurrection? Tell us, how are the dead raised? Can you explain that? Maybe you've thought about that too. What about people who drown and are eaten by a fish? How does that one work? Listen, God can do anything. Don't think about it too long. But this is what the Apostle Paul says. They're trying to stump him by saying, what kind of body is this person going to have? And he says, it's just like a seed. You plant it in the ground and it dies. What comes from that seed? Well, the same thing that that seed was. He says our bodies now are temporal. They're going to die. Our new bodies are going to be eternal. They're better. Oh, I want you to know, a lot better. And you know what Paul said reminds us of what Jesus said. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. You know, the Bible never avoids talking about death. It's from lid to lid. It starts with the very first story in the Bible. When Adam and Eve are in a perfect place in the Garden of Eden, and God says, if you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will die. The rest of the Old Testament is an account of this. If you've ever read the, uh, the begats, as you call them, you know, the boring parts, right? Did you notice what happened? Every one of those dudes died. And he died, he lived this long, and then he died, and then he lived, and then he died. And after a while, you think, yeah, yeah, what is God trying to tell you? Something, maybe? And in the New Testament, it's spelled out for us in three simple phrases. And that is that all have sinned, all because of sin die. It is appointed unto men once to die. Guys, every one of us has an appointment. In Romans 8, the passage that I read this morning, you may recall that it describes this plight that we have as a groaning. It says we're groaning. It's like we've got a burden on us and we want to get rid of it, and we can't. We want to be free of this death and decay. We want to be free of sin and sickness and suffering. We want our new bodies. Well, I'll tell you something. Satan doesn't want you to get yours. We read it in Hebrews. It's the last passage that I read. Satan markets in sin and death. That's the two things he's got to sell you. Sin and death. The two are linked together. Death is his prison in this life. Every one of us enters this life. The moment we take our first breath, we're on our way to our last. And you can't ever go back and take one over. You're on a one-way trip. As long as we're mired in a fear of death and we can't do anything about it, we'll never experience joy in this life or the life to come. Somebody has well said the only person who has a right to smile in this life is a person who knows where he's going to spend the next. Well, Jesus can set us free. He can set everybody free from lives of slavery to sin and death. And that's what God wants. Sin, believe it or not, it was never part of God's plan. I don't care what somebody tells you, whether, you know, oh, well, God planned the sin. No. God's plan for us was never sin. 
it was never dead. But now we're stuck on this. It's like you're on a train. That train is going to arrive one day at the station of death. You can lean your head out the window. You can see the station coming. So what will you do? Well, Jesus has a simple offer for you. You ready? Let somebody else die for you. Let me explain this. Sin causes death. So the first thing you need is somebody who has no sin, right? Well, there's a problem there because it says that all have sinned and fall short. So there, you can't have anybody else die for you. I'm sorry, every person who ever lived is a sinner. So it's going to take God himself to become a man and commit no sin. And not only that, he's then going to have to choose to die. Because he doesn't have to. He has no sin. I think you know where I'm going. That's where Jesus comes in. Jesus came from heaven. Jesus lived a sinless life and he died for our sins. And that is the good news. I can have my sins forgiven by believing in Jesus who died in my place. But wait, there's more. I know that sounds like a game show. I love doing that. There is more. Because not only did Jesus die on the cross, he rose from the dead. And just as his death can take the place of yours, so his life can also become yours. And that is the only way that somebody can say, I'm not afraid of dying and not just be whistling in the wind. You can say it. Because you know. You can't say it if you don't. Randy Alcorn writes, If we don't know Jesus, we will fear death and its sting. And we should. Here at New Braunfels Bible Church, we're all about good news. Uh, the resurrection seals the deal for the greatest news anyone could ever hear. Your sin can be forgiven. Death can be defeated. You can know that you have eternal life. It's all available and it's free to any who will believe in Jesus as their Savior. And in a world of wash and bad news, the resurrection turns everything else on its head. I know, I'm like you guys. If you turn on the TV, it ruins my day. If you watch the evening news, you know, you need to take something. Uh, to just get over it. But you know something? Billions of Christians around the world celebrate this day every year. Why? Because the battle of this world rages, but the war has already been won. This is good news. Like every offer of good news, I better tell you the bad news too. I recently watched a, a video. I don't know why I do this. I love these videos. I watched a video of a tsunami. You ever watch these videos? They're amazing. I don't think I'll ever want to live near the ocean again. I love the ocean, though. But in this video, it was taken by somebody who was standing on a deck. It was in Indonesia. And he had his camera fixed on the horizon. And he could see a ginormous wave coming. And so on the video, he starts shouting. Oh, and it wasn't, it was in another language, but, you know, it said, he's shouting at people, telling them, there's a wave coming, there's a tsunami coming, get out. And it was interesting, his, his camera, there was a little road between him and the beach. And, and you saw these people, and he's shouting this, and some people are looking up, like, what are you talking about? Other people totally ignored him. And then you can see out to the side of the camera, there are people who are jumping, and they're starting to clamber upstairs and run up the road behind them. A few minutes later, as the camera ran, the tsunami hit. Water just swept through this town. 
picking up all kinds of things, vehicles, moving houses, and of course, anybody who was in them. Those who listened were saved. Thousands, oblivious to danger, some of them, were swept away to their deaths. And I use this only as an illustration. There is a tsunami of death, and it's coming for every one of us. You can't escape it. It's coming. You can say you don't fear it. You can mock those who shout their warnings. But you cannot escape it. But listen, today, because Jesus rose from the dead, I offer you God's eternal life insurance policy. It's great. Let me tell you, it guarantees you resurrection life that starts today, and it goes on forever. And yes, it's free. That is how you defeat the fear of death once and for all. Believe in the Lord Jesus. You will be saved. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for the story of the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, this is a story that today many disbelieve, some mock at, some say they'll think about it. But Lord, the day will come for every one of us, and we do not know when when each one of us will pass through the end of this life and at that point in time, we want to have eternal life, life that goes on. For everyone here this morning and for anyone right now who is thinking, I'm not sure that I know, oh Lord, will you wrap your arms of love around them and draw them to yourself Help them to understand that your love is what can rescue them now. For you have sent your son to die for their sin. And by believing in Jesus, they can receive the forgiveness of sin and the great bonus of life forever with you. Oh, Lord, thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Stand with us. Let's sing this together as we close. When Jesus died, it was for our freedom, breaking the bondage of sin. Now the redeemed will live forever. Shout to the Savior of men and all of our shame was washed away the day the heroes celebrate the day the heroes there's power in the way heroes bless his holy name The cross forsaken, the glorious King is taken, all our sins upon His head. The death in the grave were broken, the light of the world is spoken, we are free, we've been redeemed heroes.
God bless you. We hope you have a great rest of your Easter Sunday. We want to say if uh, you're here this morning and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, never entered a personal relationship with him, we're going to have some uh, people up here at the front available for you to come talk to. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.